Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much. Welcome to the Les Turner ALS Foundation, February's ALS Learning Series with Rachel Marsden. Before we begin our webinar today, I just want to remind you all that you are muted, you are off camera, so you can just sit back, relax, and enjoy the presentation. The presentation should be about an hour. We want to be mindful of everybody's time. And I know um, if you're in America and in the central time zone, you are sharing your lunch. So we want to be mindful um, of your time as well. Um, you may notice on the right of your screen, there is a chat box. So feel free to drop any questions or comments into that. Um, we will have a Q&A at the end of the presentation today. And then lastly, the program is being recorded. So if you know somebody who had signed up but couldn't attend today, or um, you might need to leave halfway through the presentation at any point, it will be recorded and it'll be uploaded to our website within the next couple days. So let's get started. I'm Anne Marie Doyle. I am the a uh, community education manager for the Les Turner ALS Foundation. I wanna thank you all again for joining us. And before we get started, I wanna tell you a little bit more about the foundation. All right, so the ALS Learning Series is made possible because of a generous donation from the Gilbert and Jacqueline Fern Foundation and our industry partners, Mitsubishi Tanaba Pharma America. So who are we? We are leaders in comprehensive, personalized ALS care and research. And we realize that people living with ALS um, may feel overwhelmed um, and unsure of what questions to ask or what to do next. And that's really where our support service team shines. Our support service team is comprised of knowledgeable and compassionate nurses and social workers with many years of experience guiding people and their families affected by ALS. We offer a variety of services, including but not limited to care visits by ALS support coordinators, need-based grants, and connecting people with community resources. At the Lewis and Solia ALS Clinic at the Les Turner ALS Center at Northwestern Medicine, we're offering access to enrollment in clinical trials and a multidisciplinary care team to provide comprehensive support. We know that making decisions about ALS care can be overwhelming, but again, we're here to help. The Les Turner ALS Foundation has resources to help you learn about your options. Please visit lessturnerals.org forward slash resources. And if you're looking for more information on symptoms and care options or are interested in viewing past uh, learning series topics, feel free to visit us at lessturnerals.org. Okay, so now I am so excited for you all to meet Rachel Marsden. Rachel is a nurse consultant and care center coordinator for the Oxford MND Care and Research Center in Oxford, United Kingdom. She provides a point of contact service for patients between clinic visits and facilitates the communication of information between all those locally involved in an individual patient's care. She also provides emotional support for patients and their caregivers. In 2019, she was awarded the Allied Health Professional Award by the International Alliance of ALS MMD Associations, recognizing her commitment to providing exceptional care to people with ALS and MMD. She also serves as co-chair of the Allied Professional Forum through the International Alliance of ALS MMD Association. So Rachel, welcome and thank you so much for your time today. Um, I am going to make you the presenter now. So you should be able to share your screen. Okay, I can try and share my screen. Great, oh, I see it. Great. Okay, so I just need to do that. Is that okay? Can you see that okay? Yeah, that looks great. 
Okay. Okay. So, um, Anne-Marie, I just really want to thank you for your lovely introduction and thank you so much for asking me to chat with you today. I guess I have to really say that I'm a nurse by background. I am an only, I'm not only a nurse, I never say only a nurse, but I am a nurse, but I am not um, a sex therapist or anything like that. Just doing, talking and supporting our patients in, in Oxford. And what I want to do is chat a little bit about about the relationship kind of talking about relationships and sharing experiences and um, hopefully to be able to get you the audience just understanding and giving you the confidence to think and think that you too can probably chat and talk to your patients um, about their relationships and intimate care so um, I put this up uh, because it made me laugh in a way, but also um, it made me realise and think that it actually on Monday, just Monday, uh, I was chatting to a patient of ours. She's 72 and she she made me smile because her, she's actually got bulbar onset MND and so not 100% easy to understand. And she said to me, that um, when I was chatting, she said, part of my problem is I have very vivid dreams at night and I'm worried that I won't be able to masturbate during, um, you know, following that, that gets me back off to sleep. I had to double, do a slight double take and also ask her to kind of repeat what she had said, which she did. And then I explained the reason that I'd asked her to repeat it was because, I mean, she's actually a doctor in background and she used a lot of technical terms. And I thought she'd said to me, I'm not gonna be able to masticate, you know, chew um, at night. So I just wanted to clarify that we were talking about the same thing and we were, and um, that was fine. And we had a really good conversation um, about kind of female vibrators that might help her kind of relieve this worry and something that with her failing kind of weakening hands, she'll be able to use herself. So. These conversations pop up out of nowhere, and it's it's it takes a little bit of kind of just understanding and being able to talk and respond because it takes a lot of courage for somebody to talk to you and ask you questions. So, just kind of overriding about thinking about sexuality in itself, and I think there are so many different um, descriptions. Um, of sexuality but really it's it's our values and beliefs it embodies everything that we are about our relationships our genders and the interesting thing is that our sexuality may change uh, throughout our life and um, it's changing and evolving but it's really very unique to each and every one of us so that's you know as I say there are so many different definitions but I think that's a very all-encompassing and then um, sexuality is also um, the RCN definition. It's talking about dimensions and remains uh, the element of who we are. And I think for me as a nurse, the RCN is our, our recognised body uh, in the UK. And for them to be thinking very seriously about this and publishing information makes me feel confident that sexuality is something that comes into my practice. So. The background to um, me thinking about this is thinking about sexual relationships are really a very important part of people's lives generally. When things are going well, they're great, but when there's a problem, it's difficult and challenging. And I think people living with MND face more, more problems. Um, the uh, research shows and has kind of demonstrated that sexual interest is still in the important and significant part of people's lives despite their physical limitations and yet or you know their disability it's still an incredible um so it's incredible importance to people even those people who may well be incredibly disabled using tracheostomies they're still their sexual sexuality and their sexual activity is still so important to each person so we just need to bear that in mind Patients also, what we do know, and I think probably you realise through your own practice, is that they don't often volunteer their concerns. 
uh, because they may well feel uh, embarrassed. They don't know how we'll react. It's a big, it's a big unknown really uh, for them to ask a healthcare professional for help. And interestingly, and I know this information is is kind of this, this data goes back to 1996, but I don't actually think a great deal has changed since then. Um, patients would prefer healthcare professionals to raise the subject and talk to them about it. So we've left with this kind of dynamic that the standoff, that the patients want to talk about it, the healthcare professionals don't want to talk about it, they want the patients want the professionals to mention things, and it can only lead to frustration, I feel. So being given a diagnosis of MND, relationships change undoubtedly. Um, they can involve more anxiety, fear, depression and fatigue. And the balance of relationships can also change uh, where a, a partner may have confidence, they, if they're worried about their limitations, they might be the less dominant person and with the person, their, their partner having MND, they might not know how to initiate and, and Take that relationship further. So also position. There's lots of different um, thinking and positioning for people who are finding it difficult to lie flat uh, and lying in bed. It's, you know, that, that's all of these things change subtly, but enough to change a relationship. My guess, you know, the only kind of cautionary tale I would say is just be mindful that not everybody has had a positive experience in their relationship in the past and therefore sometimes you know they might be um, less kind of forthcoming but on the whole people will be able to talk to you about it um, and the, the other kind of things that become very apparent with relationships is partners who were a partner may well become a carer and that involves, again, a, ch a change in their role. The carer may become more um, kind of tired, compassion fatigue, and also there's an element of stress involved in that. And I think that changing identity for partners can, can be really challenging for both, both in the couple. So also for, special, and I think little, um, little known really a little thought about is that the medication uh, that we prescribe people uh, can also affect their sexual function for example you know some patients may well be on antidepressants and this can affect a person's desire their arousal and or some make um, orgasm very challenging and, and very difficult and also a lot of the drugs that we use to reduce saliva can also cause vaginal dryness and therefore you know people might need to be using lubricants and if they're using a condom then a water-based lubricant is better than an oil-based so those kind of little things that we we suggest for one thing causes a another problem and we just have to be thoughtful about that so um i think mnd is or I'm so, I keep saying uh, MND. I'm very aware that it's a kind of an international organ, uh, kind of audience where you're most probably more familiar with the term ALS. But in England, I suppose we sometimes call it ALS MND, but we very much often call it motor neuron disease. So I apologise for my Englishness on this. Um, but MND, a, a diagnosis can, for some people, affect their thinking and behaviour. Uh, the, the person living with MND may appear to be less caring or have interest in others and that's something we very much recognise uh, as with the part of the cognitive changes and they have, may have little insight into them or have the feelings of others and again this is important to be able to help support partners and carers to be explaining about some of the changes and it's not necessarily a personal thing and directed at them but it's just makes in kind of people's relationships um, can change and, and differ and I think somebody to express their concerns about it to you and you can say do you know what this does happen this is this is you know we do recognize this and it's not you sometimes that can be helpful 
So also people's priorities might change. Um, sex drive may differ. The intimacy will still be important. And I think it's, it's with all the changes, and um, I don't I need to tell you this as an audience, I'm sure you have more experience in it of looking after people with ALS, MND, and you're hugely aware about the impact of a diagnosis. And a lot of it is about loss and about changing lives. And it's about constantly, not just changing once, but constantly changing and adapting and changing. And I think it's to encourage or to be able to, as a, as a, as a, a kind of a couple or a partnership, to be able to talk to one another. And um, really, I think sometimes we get taken over by possibly paid carers coming in, about people, about professionals interfering and all that kind of thing. And it's about trying as a couple to maybe allow them to have private kind of uh, quality time together for couples to talk and explain their feelings and listen to one another. And I know that may sound obvious, but sometimes those are put on the back burner because there are more pressing issues that, um, that take, you know, about nutrition, about breathing, about, you know, things that become more important. And these things that are just as important can be forgotten or, or left and mostly, you know, forgotten about in some ways. So um, I think it's about meeting people's needs and expectations and relationships in different ways thinking and you know for patients thinking about mast masturbation possibly or sex toys and things that they can be shared or um alone and i think for some this is this is kind of conversations they want to be able to normalize and to make okay that they can discuss and um and think of ways forward for them so I challenged myself, I mean, many years ago, I think, you know, as a nurse, we always say that we give and we try to deliver holistic care and holistic meaning whole care. And does that mean washing somebody's teeth and putting makeup on and making sure they look kind of good, nice and attractive? And but actually, is it is that what we do if we're missing out the whole conversation about uh, their their kind of their sexuality we're also missing out on a large chunk of who that person is and if we fail to address that we're not really able to say that we do holistic care we do good care possibly but maybe not as holistic as we'd like to think we are and i think holistic management um this should involve, and as I mentioned before, you know, for even, and I know it's a, a UK based thing, but the, the fact that the RCN recognised sexuality as being an important part of a human's life, it really kind of emphasises it is a nurse's or a therapist's duty or kind of support to be there. But just, you know, for those health care professionals in the audience, I just wonder if you, for a moment, consider how often do you talk about sex and relationships with the people you look after? How comfortable do you feel? And I know, I really, I do know that there are many people who feel very comfortable and very confident in broaching the subject, talking and supporting their patients. And that's absolutely fabulous. And I, but there are others who may think, oh, do you know, that's not my job. <laughs> it's somebody else's job. And I, and I don't really want to ask and I don't wish to, you know, check. And I check in on that. And I think, you know, if we just ask yourself for a moment and if your if you're relatives or patients in the audience, just think, is that something I'd like to talk to somebody about? Is that somebody I'd like to just have a moment to discuss this? And do I feel confident enough to talk about it? You may, as I say, be saying, yep, I do that and I, you know, absolutely no problem. But I wonder if there are a few people who are thinking, gulp, is that really for me to do? I'm not sure I feel comfortable. And for those people, I would say, do you know what? You talk about it all the time from your best friends, your mates, if they're having kind of relationship problems or something's not going quite right, are you not the first person to say, do you know what you need to do? You need to da da da. And you chat and you talk and you know, women and, and men, you know, they talk a lot about 
other people's relationships with your friends it's just that you're talking to friends and family but may not be your patients so just have a, a thought for a moment and this might be a model that you're very familiar with it's um, written by James Anon and this was again it was in 1974 but I actually don't think things have changed much and I think it's still a very useful model uh, to explore and help you uh, in talking about those awkward conversations and it's called plicit and the p stands for permission which i think if nothing else this is the most important lesson which will is about giving people permission to talk and allowing them to know that you are open uh, to listen to talk um, and to have that conversation the li is for limited information and that may well be uh, giving of a leaflet, uh, talking or, or saying, you know, something kind of very basic. Um, and for those people who have, for example, had a heart attack on discharge or maybe before that in, in the UK, the patient may be given a leaflet about the relationships and about uh, sex and about kind of how much um, strain to put on their hearts, things like that, and a leaflet. It's very useful. But uh, you know, specific suggestions may well be thinking about um, more specific to that person. Really, uh, thinking about we talked, I talked about um, position earlier. For those people who might be breathless when they lie flat, have they thought about not just being a bed or you know, with about providing privacy? Uh, thing, um, thinking about the sofa or a chair where they can be more comfortable and upright, and breathing isn't a problem so specific that's specific instructions and um, suggestions and uh, intensive therapy that may well be uh, a situation where somebody has had a poor a bad relationship in the past or you know really need more intensive therapy or uh, counseling than you or I are possibly able to give and maybe they do need to be referred to a specialist who can help them work things through um, and that's intensive therapy. So that, I think that's a really useful model, except it has its issues and some things that, I mean, it's linear. So one would start at the top and work down. And sometimes, as I mentioned before, the permission bit is the most important bit. And permission can be bypassed. If I just hand somebody a leaflet and say, here you go, off you go, I haven't, given that permission or I haven't allowed them to give the permission I've just gone straight to the limited information and they don't know what to do with it and they don't know how to come back at me to talk to me about it so permission may be implicit and we haven't kind of given them that that kind of open conversation that can allow them to come back and it suggests the implicit model, although very good, it's accept, it suggests it's a one way process and it's not something we revisit from time to time, but we've done it and we've done it once and that's it. I don't need to do it again. So, um, some of my colleagues, Bridget Taylor and, um, and Sally Davis, thought about this quite carefully and thought actually the permission giving element is the most important part and therefore that should be at the middle of everything we do. And then we reflect, we can give permission, we might give limited information, but we can give permission again. And then we might give, and never said, specific uh, suggestions. But that permission is central and we might revisit every time they come, but it is part of the conversation. And then we can, we can be more self-aware, we can reflect how that went and review, we can think about our knowledge and we can challenge assumptions. So this model is the explicit because it's kind of the extended plicit model. But I don't need you to, you don't need to worry about, I mean, you can definitely, there's a, there is a reference for you to be able to um, look and read more about this. But I think what I just really, really want you to think about is that middle P, that permission, which I think is the most important thing. And I was talking to um, Anne-Marie earlier, and one of the reasons I started to think about this conversation and discussing sexuality in a better way was 
I think it was, I mean, I'm about to retire, so this was a long time ago. When I was a student nurse, I was out working with a district nurse, the nurses that work in the community. And I thought this district nurse I was working with was so cool. I just thought I want to be her. I thought she had fantastic communication. She chatted, she was really cool. And I kind of just followed her around thinking, this is brilliant. I want to be just like you. And we were at a patient's house and um, they had this patient had MS and she and her husband were sitting, sitting down and we went in and we sat down and we were chatting. And then out of the blue, I can remember this, this district nurse's name, but I won't name names. But um, she said, so tell me, how's your sex life? And on that, the patient told her to get well, I won't tell you exactly what she said, but she in no, unknown certain terms said, none of your business. And the husband got up and walked out the room. And that really made me think, for all the great things, that conversation was so wrong. And you'll, I, by me telling you, you'll, you'll agree, I should imagine, that that was so wrong and it confronted the patient and they weren't ready, they weren't expecting it, they didn't know what to say. And their reaction was to walk out or to tell her to mind her own business, really. But had she, and this is where this, this permission kind of comes in, had they, she said, do you know what? MS can really impact on relationships. All that's all she needed to say. She could sit back and see what they said and wait and see and not push it any further. And they may have said, God, tell me about it. It's ter terrible. Or they may have said, yeah, I know. Or I'm not gone. But next time she goes, they will know that she is open to a conversation. So it might not have happened then. But, you know, they, they had a good rapport with this, with this district nurse. So this might be something that they can revisit and she can reflect. So she would have given permission. She would have reflected and thought, OK. They looked like they wanted to talk. Next time I can do it. So this P is the important P, really, for, for us as practitioners. And I think many people find um, the relationship kind of, it, it is challenging and it changes with time with MND. And it has such an impact on um, people's relationships. So a couple of things that people could say very simply as a healthcare professional, you could say that. You know, many people find their relationships change once they've been diagnosed with MND. That's the permission. Or uh, MND can have a big impact on couples' relationships, and they can leave it as that and see what happens. I sometimes talk about because patients need to want to say say things like, "Is my eyesight affected?" And I can say. No, your eyesight won't be affected. Your smell, your taste, your sensations your sexual health, your kind of your sexuality, that won't be impacted, but it may well be something you need to think and change and develop and you know, adapt as things go. And that might be my permission so they get, they get that they can come back and talk to me about it and another time. I might not have that conversation then, but I can wait and they can wait, but they know that I'm open to chatting about it. And I think we, as healthcare professionals, when we're talking, we just need to challenge our own assumptions, um, challenge the thought about age, and you know, particularly as I get older, I, you know, my children, of course, as a parent, as a, they don't have sex, they, um, you know, they don't, you don't want to know about your parents, they just never did it, and you know, older people, we may well think that that doesn't happen or it's not important, but what we do know, we do know from research age it makes no difference people at any age they basically want to be loved and they want to you know people to they want to be attractive and they do wish to you know they still have that sexuality it might be changing we need to feel comfortable and be able to talk to gay and homosexual couples and widows and widowers because it's just as important and regardless of a person's level of disability all of these people, it's just really basically saying everybody, there is nobody, there's no one person that you wouldn't want to not give that permission to. Whether they accept it, whether they want to talk about it, it's their choice then. 
and you just you know you don't have to do anything else but when we did a study um about sexuality about how much we actually did talk about it um we found that the majority of patients that we gave permission were were very relieved actually to have the opportunity to talk about their their relationships and in some instances they were probably more relaxed about it than we were you know as professionals where they were open and chatting and that kind of gave us the confidence to know we were doing the the right thing no one has ever been angry or offended by me giving them permission to talk about it they may well once one farmer once one wife said i'm a farmer's wife i don't do that kind of thing and then we giggle oh, you know but that was the response and that was their choice and it's very clear that that wasn't something she wished to talk about and that's absolutely fine but i think we everybody is concerned that by talking to um patients you may open a can of worms well actually you don't you really don't and if you do you're thinking of it in terms of implicit or explicit those more challenging situations there's always somebody that they could you could be referred on for more help and support but by giving permission listening talking to them you know if they need more help that's out of your remit but otherwise we are healthcare professionals we are we are there to help and support but we're also you know those beings who have had relationships ourselves and you're the first person to be able to talk to your friend about what to do if they're you know they can't you know whatever you you are there for them and therefore you are probably well well qualified to deal with um, discussions with your patients about their relationship um i think sometimes it's very easy in a clinic setting to other things are more important you know very sometimes people are coming in and they've lost weight and their breathing's a problem and this has happened and that's what happened and fallen out the wheelchair obviously lots of things take priority but it's just trying to maybe find a position in your normal routine of chatting that triggers a conversation that triggers you to say you know for occupational therapists they're called occupational therapists in the uk may be talking about uh bed positioning you know that's incredibly important because the first thing here anyway i'm sure it, you know it's different in in the, not in the uk but lot very often a hospital bed means they're coming out of their double bed their marital bed and they're living they're then in a hospital in a kind of hospital bed and this is this happens without necessarily the the discussion and thought that actually um by doing so may really have a dynamic effect on a relationship so it's kind of we need to be thinking more of this and it's possible with a bit of practice and a bit of confidence that talking about a person's sexual um kind of being can become a routine part of your conversation which just as I say, allowing permission can trigger and make you think and have more conversations. And, you know, explicit model can be used to address other things, not just sexuality. You can think in terms of talking about end of life, talking about resuscitation wishes, giving that permission for people to know you're wanting to chat and talk and follow their lead is, is a great kind of model to enable you to do that. So kind of in summary, um, it's a circular nature. You can readdress and revisit it at any one time and start by giving the opportunity to give permission. Um, try if you can to use it with all your patients possibly. And um, I think, you know, it's a good, it's a really sound, sound um, place to start. Um, I know Amory is going to put in the chat some links to your kind of um, her talks and um, kind of leaflets. But this is something Bridget um, Taylor and I wrote uh, for the Motor Neuron Disease Association. And I think it's a, a fair, I've got one link, and Amory is going to pop up the other links in the, the chat and also your own um, ones. But I think there's this is, um, we've written two, or it's kind of incorporates the carers 
or partners and person people living with MND. So this is a, this is just a little shout out for that, and you can download it. And um, some references if uh, for further reading and anything you're interested in. What I haven't put up is the um, the research that uh, Rachel Botel and I did looking into and trying to um, kind of validate the explicit model. So now I think Anne Marie, are you there? There's um, any questions? I am. I am. I am here. Rachel, Rachel, thank you so much. What a lovely, lovely presentation. Um, and I was kind of manning the chat here. Oh, sorry. I thought I was in presentation mode. Um, but I thank you so much for sharing the idea of like asking for permission. I think that's so, so important. Um, one thing that kind of came up was, and I think I, I'm not really surprised by this, but somebody had mentioned being on their ALS journey for four years and no one, a doctor, an aide, a therapist never brought this up and they really wished that they had. So in an instant like that, where maybe you've been going to a care center um, and nobody has kind of brought this up, but it's something that you do want to bring up, um, how might you recommend kind of broaching that subject with your doctor or your occupational therapist or your physical therapist? Well, I think people are very sensitive to the people that are open to it. And of the people, the, the patients that come to us, I think they they will know one person is possibly more open about it than than another um, because of because of the vibes, because of the discussions yeah. they've possibly had about you know all sorts of things. They know who they'd like to chat to. They could also use the explicit explicit model on the on the professional and I'm ask professional. They could uh, look at looking at your leaflet or my leaflet. They could print it off and take it and say, "Is this something we can talk about?" and see their reaction, or this is something I would like to talk about. And I think in our clinic, sometimes if it's if a person, the patient has said something to the doctor, they say, "Do you know what? Next door, Rachel, just chat, just tell her." And you know, and when they come through, they say, "Oh, Kevin said I need to talk to you about." It. And I go, "Okay, I know exactly." You know, but I know exactly what if, you mean. <laughs> what so, but I think you know, no disrespect to them. They they happen to be neurologists, and they happen not to be very very comfortable. It makes me smile because they do. They are funny, but they know that it will be addressed in our clinic by myself and my team and my nurse, the nurse that I work with and the occupational therapist I work with, because that's what we can do. And um, you know, maybe we're the best, best place. So I think patients are wily, they're wise and they work out. You know, as a, you know, it's a lot of there's a lot of uh, research done about from you know gay and lesbian uh, couples going to a physician or a doctor. And they're checking out everything to decide whether to kind of tell somebody that they're a couple or not. And they might not disclose it if they're not comfortable. They'll look at the brochures in the waiting room. They'll look at the conversations. They'll look at the pictures on the walls. And they'll decide whether somebody is open to that relationship or not. And they won't talk about it if they don't think somebody's open to it. But if they see that the information available is both men and women of different couples and color and gender and all sorts of things, they're more likely to bring that up. So they're they're checking you out as a professional as well. And I think it's just that's why we need to be able to give permission to people, whether they know it or not. They yes. well, then, you know they might they might not do anything. And as I, I was mentioning to you earlier, having given permission to a couple um, they didn't really say anything. I saw a little glance between the two of them, a little look, and that was fine. But then they called me on the phone and she said, it's easier me, I don't have to, you don't have to look at me, I don't have to look at you, but this is my problem. And that was fine. And we chatted, you know, for a while, but I had given them that permission for them to go away, to come back and to talk to me about it. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think that time is so important to kind of let something marinate for a little bit. And you're right, it can be challenging to have these discussions face to face and maybe somebody might be more prone to thinking about it and then maybe writing a message to their doctor through the portal system that their clinic uses or calling somebody like, hey, yeah. do you have time to talk about this a little bit more in depth? Yeah, but yeah. you can guarantee that every single person we see, their relationship has been impacted by a diagnosis of MND. And it was, if we're starting from that position, we just know that it's, it's a topic as much as eating, drinking, elimination, bowels, you know, all of those things, it's as important. Yeah, it's an activity of daily living, right? Yeah, um, yeah. I think about my occupational um, therapist friends um, and former colleagues, like it's just as important as some of those other, um, you know, things that occupy our time. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And um, somebody had brought up, and I believe your guide on the MMDA um, website, and I did drop that link, I believe it's the first one in the chat, everyone. Um, but somebody brought up the idea of like caregiver exhaustion and how to better communicate that to maybe their spouse or significant other um, related to intimacy and relationships. Um, and I believe your guide goes into some more direct um, tips regarding that, correct? I think so. I think we were very aware when Bridget was, was um when we were writing the guide that um, one couple, uh, the husband was given a hospital bed and you know, they were in their eighties and he was in the hospital bed and the wife, the pair of them wished to be together and have some time, you know, whether it's, uh, it's just, they wanted to be intimate. So she got the hoist, well, but before the hoist, she got an air mattress and she blew that up, a double air mattress. And so she pumped that up then she got a hoist, then she tried to hoist him out of the bed onto the mattress. And by the time she'd done all of this and then get him comfortable and then da, 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 she just crashed down beside him and was just totally exhausted. She said, after all of that, it took me over an hour and all we could do was lie close and giggle and just think, what do we try this again? But actually, I suppose even that, even that, the lying and giggling together was important to them. And she was exhausted. She was said, I'm too, I was too tired to then start to make love, to take my clothes off. I couldn't be, couldn't be, yeah, too tired. But it is, um, it's a big issue. And also, you know, care, as a caregiver, your relationship changes. The way the person may view, be viewed, it, it's all changing. And I think it's, possible for care for couples to be able to talk to themselves and just tell each other how they're feeling it's possibly easier for me to say than for them to do because it can be hurtful it can be challenging but it's honest I think yeah and I know you had mentioned the idea of using that explicit um kind of model when talking with maybe a professional who hasn't brought this subject up, but what are your thoughts on significant others bringing that up? Yeah. Um, where, you know, maybe the communication, again, like you said, that relationship can change and evolve through, throughout the journey. Um, so using that as a model to kind of test the waters to say, you know, can we talk about this or can I explain maybe my side of things and then I want you to talk about what how you feel um absolutely and I don't think you know people can whiz through it and you might people might think oh gosh that's far too complicated I'm not going there but actually you don't have to you just have to forget it all and just remember the permission and just opening up a conversation then we all do it we do it all the time. We have a, oh, we say, oh, that's rubbish. You know, we we also, as healthcare professionals, must remember we just don't have the answer for everything. We're never going to solve a lot of problems. We don't solve, you know, I, we can't solve everything. There's, if people are asking about, they may well be single and on their own and want to partner. Well, that's everyday hardship. 
and that's you know hard not hardship it, it's difficult if you're chasing for that perfect person given m and d or not it's still it's still tricky and i you know I, it's not something that i could even say oh yes i can find you the ideal partner that's not going to be that's not happening but you know they i could say oh are you looking on whatever website or what do you do i don't know i can ask them what they do um and i can chat about it and i can agree that life's hard flicking left or flicking right oh i'm glad oh, i don't need to do that but that's you know just acknowledging that's tricky and that's you know that's got to be as important and i think your guide also goes into that for people that are younger um and well actually i shouldn't say just younger but people who are maybe single and dating or um wanting to date and there's some great advice on um how to disclose your diagnosis when you're dating, um, you know, ideas to consider when you're dating, um, which I think um, are, are so fantastic. So again, that's the first link um, that I put in the chat. The second one Rachel alerted me to was for um, people who are carers or caregivers and kind of ways to look after yourself and um, some great advice there. And then the third, link is just the Les Turner website to our resources and our um, guide to relationship, sex, and intimacy. Yeah. Um, oh, there is a question. Um, when doing the explicit, um, using that model, which one should give the permission? Is it only the nurse or who should be? which one should be giving well i think to? any any healthcare um, yeah. professional it could be the occupational therapist or the yeah. physiotherapist and i think actually um the occupational physiotherapists are pro possibly in a kind of having a very different we all have different relationships are different with our with our patients uh, therapeutically but physios have that time they're trying to it's the patients have time to talk to them as well so it, it can be anybody it it's anybody with the confidence just to say oh that changes that you know things are changing and that's harder and you know i understand you know i understand so i think it's it's any healthcare professional who is prepared to take that leap of faith and get that confidence to have those com com conversations and I would challenge anybody listening to think about it go away you don't have to be hugely knowledgeable about explicit as I say the P really mm -hmm. if nothing else and you know thinking about the limited information you can give but the P is the the important thing is just allowing people to express their concerns really about their relationships or maybe not concerns maybe they're you know the opposite um many people uh you'll find well it, in our clinic people come and say they're getting married because they know life is short and they change and again the relationship you can chat about that um and that's a you know in a positive way in a positive light yeah you brought up um i mean my i don't know if everybody knows this but my background was rehabilitation medicine i was a speech pathologist but you just gave me the idea of like what a lovely co-treat or group interdisciplinary plan right where the physical therapist might and occupational therapist might have suggestions on um, positioning and breathing the speech therapist can work on communication if you're having difficulty expressing yourself maybe it's a, a signal or a gesture um you know your um saliva management like this is such yeah. um, an important piece um that it's like you're huge. Right, all, all providers can be um I think, yeah and i think when you're thinking okay. about saliva management lots of people say do you know my grand in for a start they might say my grandchildren when i kiss them they wipe their face because i'm slobby and then my partner i can see they don't want to kiss me because of this or i haven't got the lip control and you know again that is speech to language therapist that's um you know that's medics and thinking about uh, saliva management and it's a team thing but if we're yeah. acknowledging 
what we need to do is to acknowledge that that person is a is a sexual being and that they're you know that's important to them and we can help them to live their lives as you know as fulfilled a way as possible really and by not addressing not thinking about their relationships or sex and intimacy we are if you think of a cheese kind of a big pie chart i don't know what section but we're missing out on yeah. a big part of it which is important to people yeah oh rachel thank you so much for your time today i really appreciate it and everyone rachel's out in england so i believe it's almost 7 p.m your time oh it's nearly my bedtime yeah oh goodness we gotta get you <laughs> home <laughs> oh no we're gonna go home first yeah i'll hop on my bike no it's, it's very dark and miserable here yeah uh, well, thank you so much for your time, Rachel. You're very welcome. Um, and everybody, thank you so much for participating, um, dropping your um, your questions and thoughts in the chat. Um, I want to alert you all to our upcoming webinar series for March. It'll be Thursday, March 23rd at lunchtime, if you're in the central time zone, um, with Dr. Catherine Lomenhurst um, talking about cognitive changes in ALS. All right, everyone, I want to thank you all again. Thank you so much for your participation in today's webinar. Um, you will notice once we log off, you will get um, a poll to a survey. So please feel free to fill that out. We are constantly learning and reaching out to all of you to make sure we're covering topics um, that are relevant to all of you. Um, and then you can also find us again at lesturnerals.org forward slash resources. We're also on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and on YouTube. Um, and we look forward to seeing you all again in March. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, this will be recorded again, so plug. It will be on our website and on our YouTube channel in the next couple days. Um, I hope everybody has a great rest of your day. Everybody stay well. Have a good one. Bye. Bye.